Well, today, I want to share for a few moments on fulfilling your God-given assignment. Fulfilling your God-given assignment. You know, at the age of 24, I was just reading this story the other day, Amy Carmichael was a missionary from Ireland to India decades ago, and uh, she just felt a call to go to India, so she left Ireland. Nobody knew, but she would never go back again. She ended up... Uh, ministering there and, and passing away in India. But when she got there, she began traveling around the nation, taking the gospel to anybody that would listen. And uh, during her travel, she began to notice that there was a lot of small girls who seemed to be living in these Hindu temples. And if you know anything about India, it's primarily Hindu and some Buddha, but primarily Hindu. And these were beautiful young girls, graceful, beautifully dressed, but they seemed to be living in the temple and not with their parents. She began to ask about it, and she discovered that these girls, and there was many, many, many of them, had been literally sold by their parents to the temple to be married to the gods. A lot of times the, children, uh, the parents, they, they needed money, and, uh, or maybe they had more kids than they could afford, and rather, rather than taking care of them, they would just sell them to the you know, the Hindu priest to be married, quote, to the gods. And most of them would end up, you know, really in a life of prostitution in that role. They were totally abused sexually and probably other ways as well. And uh, it was very hard to get away from that situation. If a girl would run away, they would do everything they could to track her down, bring her back. And then they would take a hot branding iron and brand their hands uh, you know, just to indicate who they belong to and try to deter them from running away again. And when Amy found out about what was going on, she was literally shocked and horrified and began to pray about this. And, you know, she just wondered how any parent could sell their children to, you know, the temple to be married to the gods and involved in prostitution and abused like that. And so she really began to pray about it. And uh, she ended up rescuing one of those little girls. Her name was Prina. I think she was six years old. Brought her into the, her home and took care of her and fed her. And the word began to get out among these girls that there was a way to get out, a way to be rescued. And so one by one, Amy Carmichael began to rescue these girls from the temple. And she built a home, established a place for them to come in. And over the years that she was there, she literally rescued Dozens and dozens and dozens of these girls and educated them, taught them about Christ and, uh, you know, totally rescued their life. Here's the deal. Amy, Amy Carmichael discovered her God-given assignment. In the process of going to take the gospel, she discovered really a specific assignment that God had given her to accomplish with her life on the earth. You know, the Apostle Paul was another man who lived with an understanding that he had a God-given assignment and nothing else mattered to him more than fulfilling that. In Acts chapter 20, I was reading uh, that passage this week. Uh, Paul was talking about uh, his, his travels, his missionary uh, travels and taking the gospel uh, all over the known world. And he began to speak about feeling compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem and take the gospel there. So he got on a ship, and he was headed in that direction, but he would stop along the way at different ports. And he came to a port that was close to the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was a place where Paul had started a church, planted a church, and had literally pastored there for about three years. He probably poured more of his self and his time and his energy into that church than all the other churches that he had started. And he literally pastored those people for three years. And so he had a deep relationship with, the, with those folks. And so as he was drawing near and he came to the port, he sent word for the leadership of that church to come and meet with him. And they did that. And this is what he says in Acts chapter 20, verse, starting with verse 18. It says, when they arrived, he declared, now you know that from the day I set forth foot, foot in, pro in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came from me from the plots of the Jews. I have never shrunk back from telling you what, needed, what you needed to hear either publicly 
or in your homes. That's Acts chapter 20, verse 20. We call that uh, God's 2020 vision for the church. It's proclaiming God's word publicly like we're doing here, but also from house to house. That's called small groups. I hope you get in one. Verse 21. I have had one message for the Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. And then he says this, And now I am bound or compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit keeps telling me in city after city that jail and suffering await me. Now this is the scripture I feel like God really impressed on me this week. Verse 24, But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. God highlighted that scripture as I was reading it this week, and I felt like he impressed three truths on me this morning that I want to share with you. Number one, God had an assignment for Paul's life, and guess what? He's got an assignment for your life, too. Would you just say that with me? God has an assignment for my life. Paul said it. My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul was very clear that he had an assignment for the Lord. He didn't live his life like like many Christians do, just keep wondering what God's will is for their life, kind of living in the dark. No, he was very, very, he had a clarity about it. He had a focus about it. He knew exactly, specifically what God had called him to do. And he lived his life in a way that was absolutely dedicated to fulfilling that purpose in his life. I believe the Bible is clear. That God has an assignment for every one of his children. You know, Jeremiah gives us some insight into this. God spoke to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. He said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Now, let me stop there. That's not the whole verse, but let me just stop because it, uh, it brings to mind what we were talking about a little bit earlier. God values unborn children. Before I, listen, before I even formed you in the womb, Now, God formed each one in the womb. There's no accidents. There's no illegitimate children. How many know that? There's some illegitimate parents out there, but there's no illegitimate children because God formed you in your mother's womb. But he said, before I even did that, I knew you. Think about that. That's kind of mind-blowing. He knew Steve before Steve was even formed in his mother's womb. He knew Levi before he was even formed in his mother's womb. I knew you. Then he went on to say, before you were born, I set you apart. That means I have a specific assignment. You're not supposed to live your life just kind of wandering vaguely through the earth, trying to eat groceries, take up space, and maybe, you know, when you get enough money to retire, buy yourself a motorhome and travel the the nation uh, living out of camp spots until you die, you know. That is not what he said. No, he said, before you were born, I set you apart. And I appointed you as a prophet for the, the nations. In other words, God gave him assignment. He had a focus for his life. You need to know you're not an accident. You're not here out of happenstance. You're not here just because of biological reasons. You're here because God knew you before you were born and set you apart. And he has an assignment for your life. Someone said that the two greatest days of a person's life are the day that you were born and then the day that you figured out why you were born, right? Do you know the happiest people on the planet are not the people with the most money or the most toys or the least amount of problems? No, the happiest people on the earth are the people that know what their purpose is. They know what their assignment is. They know that they have a God-given task and mission from the Lord, and they live their life in such a way to fulfill that with the best of their ability, all of their heart. You know, tragically, many people never discovered, I heard of a survey, that 87% of Christians, even, 80% of Christians never really feel like they discover or understand what their God-given assignment is. And they just kind of live their, their life 
that way. They never find where they fit in, in God's scheme of things and in the body of Christ and what God's called them to do. We don't want you to live that way. We try very, very hard around here to help you understand what your assignment is. There's another percentage of people that whether they know it or not, they spend most of their life giving excuses to God why they can't fulfill the assignment that he's given them to do. You know, Jeremiah tried that. He said this in Jeremiah chapter 1. He said, alas, sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak and I'm too young. In other words, I'm just not really qualified to do what you've asked me to do. I'm not a really good public speaker. It kind of makes me nervous. My knees, you know, knock together when I get up in front of people, and I kind of forget what, I, what I'm supposed to say. And so, really, because of all those things, I'm really not qualified to do this thing that you said I'm supposed to do. And then on top of that, I'm just, I'm too young. You know, God really wasn't interested in excuses. He's not interested in your excuses either. We're not fulfilling your assignment. Don't tell me you don't have any, because I know you do. I had a whole bunch of them. God said, don't say to me, I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you. Then he says, the Lord reached out his hand and he touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over the nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy, overthrow, to build, and to plant. You know, your age does not disqualify you from your assignments. You're never too young to fulfill your assignment. Guess what? You're never too old either. It really doesn't matter if you're in your senior years or not. If you have a God-given assignment and you do, God will give you the strength. God will give you the ability. He'll keep you in your right mind to fulfill that destiny and that calling that you have in your life. You remember Moses really did not start his assignment until he was 80 years old. The first 80 years of his life was total preparation for the next 40 years of assignment in his life. Now I think about Caleb. Caleb was 85 when, when he had uh, this God-given assignment. He says, I've got to take that mountain. They'd already went into the promised land. And uh, probably a lot of folks at 85 would be looking for the rocking chair on the front porch to, uh, you know, twiddle their thumbs and wait till they just die. But not Caleb. At 85, he said, I'm as strong now as I was at 40. Why? Because he had a God-given assignment. I think a lot of older folks would find that they got all kinds of strength if they just begin to focus on the God-given assignment that, they ha that God has given them. And... and uh, you know, forget about the way that the world treats retirement. Retirement in the world's mind is basically do nothing. I got a neighbor who spends about eight hours a day trimming his bushes. Gosh, I keep saying to myself every time I, I see him, Lord, help him to know why he's here. <laughs> give, him a, give him an assignment. Give him some kind of purpose in life. Yeah, you got the best looking yard in all of the Dow's. But, the, you know, two weeks after you die, it's going to look like my yard. <laughs> Your age doesn't disqualify it. You know, I think Brett said it recently. Um, God doesn't call, call the qualified... He qualifies the called. So many times we try to disqualify ourselves because all these, all these different reasons. You know, when he was graduating from high school, Ron Mel met with a career counselor to try to help him understand what kind of careers that he could possibly pursue. So this counselor presented this kind of assessment of his natural abilities and, you know, his gifts and talents and all these things. And he took this assessment fairly in-depth and uh, then when he got done, he met with the counselor again to kind of go over the results and kind of pick a, some area, some career that he could focus on. So the counselor pointed out, you know, you got some strengths here, you got some strengths there. Then he paused and he said, there's one area that you never want to go into, and that's a career where you're doing any kind of public speaking. 
You just don't have what it takes. You don't have the ability to do it. I want to tell you, God had a different idea for Ron Mill. God led Ron Mill into full-time ministry, and eventually he became the pastor of the Beaverton Foursquare Church, which became the largest church in Oregon with 4,000 members while he was pastoring it, and he was one of the most amazing past speakers, public speakers. He was sought out at, at conferences and seminars, all kinds of things all over the world, Has written had written a number of books before he finally passed away. How many know God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. If he's got an assignment for your life, do not disqualify yourself and come up with all kinds of excuses. I had all kinds of excuses. Lord, I'm too shy to do what you've called me to do. Lord, I can't speak. Lord, I, I'm afraid of failing. And so because of all those reasons, if you, better, you better find somebody else. You know, I hear all kinds of excuses from people. I, you know, I've been in full-time ministry for, what, 38 years, something like that, and serving the Lord for longer than that. <clears throat> I run into people all the time with excuses. Here's one that people use over time. I'm too busy. I, I just don't have the time, really, to do anything that God has, has called me to do. That one's used over time. Here's my word to you. If you're too busy to serve God, you're too busy. Get rid of something out of your schedule. You know, here's something I encourage you to do. Keep a detailed log of how you spend your time. This would be scary. Of how you spend your time for at least a week, two weeks would be better. I'm talking about not just your work, but when you get off of work, all of your free time, just log everything. You know, I, I watched reruns of Gilligan's Island for three hours. Write that down. I heard of one college student that... Uh, he was challenged to do this because he was telling his professor, I just don't have time to do the homework. He said, well, keep a log for a week of how you spend your time. And he came back and he realized that he was spending seven hours a week over at the uh, student lounge area playing pool. Didn't even realize how, how much time he was wasting. Man, we waste a lot of time. We just turned off, off the TV every once in a while. We'd save ourselves hundreds of hours during our lifetime. Here's another excuse. I just don't feel comfortable doing that. You ever heard that? Do you ever say that? I was thinking about Jesus and his assignment. I kind of doubt if Jesus felt all that comfortable on the cross. But yet he was fulfilling the Father's assignment for his life. Here's another excuse. Ministry is just inconvenient. Serving other people is just inconvenient. I, I will agree with you on that. I totally agree with you. It just seemed like ministry opportunities appear when you are least prepared for them, when you don't have the time, when you feel like you're just per too burnt out to do it. Maybe you've had a ma major failure in your life, you know, just the day before, that week sometime. I don't know how many times the Lord has presented me with some ministry opportunity. I'm thinking, I am the least qualified person on the planet right now to minister this birth. They need to be praying for me, not me praying for them. I need to get saved. I don't even know if I'm saved right now. I mean, that's how you feel. The enemy just works you over time. But, uh, you know, I think those times are opportunities for God to shine his glory, to get the glory through us. And just remind us again that we have this treasure in jars of clay. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's not about my ability. It's not about bringing glory to me. It's about glorifying him and finishing the assignment that he's given us to do. Amen? Somebody say amen to that. Hallelujah. Thirsty today. Jeremiah. God broke through his fears and excuses. Don't be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. You know, uh, one of my favorite preachers is Jensen Franklin. Everybody watch him on TV. Well, he was called at a young age, as a teenager, to preach the gospel, full-time ministry. He knew that, but he literally disqualified himself because of his fear of public speaking and the shyness that, that he had. Now, it wasn't just, a, just kind of a minor kind of a fear. It was kind of a throwing up before you speak, knees knocking, face going white and pale kind of fear, like, I just can't do this. 
That, I mean, he suffered with that. But then God led him to the scripture, Jeremiah 1.8, don't be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. He said that scripture set him free, and he has lived the last number of decades fulfilling the assignment that God has, has had for his life. I think about Joyce Meyer. God called her to speak, a public speaking ministry. Now, that's not the only assignment. Your assignment might be raising godly kids. There's all kinds of assignments, but God specifically called her to speak, and she said, I can't do it. I'm afraid, and God came back to her and said, just do it afraid then. It doesn't matter to God whether you do it afraid or not afraid. He said, just do it, and in the process, she realized that God was with her. It was God's power within her, and she got rid of her fear, and she's been ministering uh, ever since to thousands upon thousands of people. Here's the second point that God impressed on me. God's assignment trumps your personal comfort. Now, I know you're not supposed to be making political statements in church, but where there is a will, there is a way. Okay, I lost you right there. Come, come back. God's assignment trumps your personal comfort. Here, here's the truth of the matter. Fulfilling, Gary, you got to like that one. You have to like that one. <laughs> Gary's on the Republican committee, so I thought he might like it. Fulfilling God's assignment is going to be tough at times. How many know that? It's, uh, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to stretch you. In fact, it's going to be so hard, just, just warning you, it's going to be so hard at times fulfilling God's assignment that you're just going to want to give up. You're going to say your flesh is going to rise up and say, I didn't sign up for this, I don't like this, and I'm done. Find somebody else. I'm sure Paul probably felt that at times, but he never gave up. In fact, I really think this is interesting. God had told him to go to Jerusalem, and then he told him, it's going to be tough. You're going to face jail. You're going to get thrown in jail without warrant. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be hardships. You're going to be persecuted. And I'm thinking, you know, if God told that, if I felt like God was speaking that to me, I might have reason to pause and think about that and say, Lord, I don't know if that's speaking to you, speaking to me or not. You know, maybe I just ate too much pizza last night. I'm just thinking I'm hearing God. And maybe I need to think about this for a minute, figure out a better strategy. That's not what Paul did. In fact, in Acts 20, verse 16, he said he was hurrying to get to Jerusalem. Even though he knew what lie ahead. Man. And again, he said, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me. I like this. I read it in a couple other uh, translations Here's one, it says, I consider my own life of no importance to me whatsoever as long as I can finish the course ahead of me. Here's another translation. I don't care about my own life. The most important thing is that I complete my mission. Here's the passion translation. But whether I live or die is not important. For I don't esteem my life as indispensable. It's more important for me to fulfill my destiny and to finish the ministry my Lord Jesus has a sign to me. Paul is saying, my comfort and my convenience are immaterial. It doesn't matter. It's not the most important thing in my life. It's not my top priority. I've been given an assignment by God, and the only thing that matters is that I fulfill it. You know, Paul knew that people were going to misunderstand him at times. Paul knew that people were going to be talking behind his back. Paul knew that he was going to face you know, persecution and, and weariness and feel like giving up. You know, I don't know of anybody that faced more hardship than Paul in fulfilling his assignment. Let me just, I know you've read this, but let me just touch on this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul was talking about some of the hardships that he went through. He said, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one, 39 lashes. That was enough to kill a man back then. A lot of people died. But 39 lashes, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was pelted with stones, three times I was shipwrecked, 
I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my fellow Jews, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the country, danger at sea, danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. But yet none of these hardships moved him. It didn't stop him. He, he was just resolute at, at finishing uh, the assignment that God had given him. Now, why was he able to keep moving forward? I believe it was this. He was not living his life for personal fulfillment, for personal enjoyment, or for personal comfort, which is the way most of Americans live their life. I'm telling you, they live for the weekends. It's all about my personal comfort. It's my convenience. It's about getting, trying to squeeze as much pleasure out of my life as I possibly can before I kick the bucket. I mean, really, that's the mentality of a lot of Americans and Westerners today. But Paul did not live his life that way. He lived a Christ-centered, other-focused life. And that's what kept him moving forward. You know, he cared more about reaching people who were going to hell, who would live an eternity in hell if they did not hear the message of God's grace in their life. And so he just kept moving forward. Somewhere in Kansas, there is a, uh, there is a cemetery called Mount Hope Cemetery. You know where that is, Gary? He's from Kansas. Okay. There is a cemetery there, and in that cemetery, you're going to find several very, very large gravestones and monuments. They were erected by a farmer. His name was John Davis, and uh, Davis was a kind of a poor farmhand in his young years, but over the years, he was able to amass quite a fortune, a considerable amount of money, but yet, you know, he... In the process of doing that, he really didn't make very many friends. Uh, he wasn't a very happy man. He was kind of a bitter man. He was bitter at his in-laws, his wife's family, because they felt like she married beneath herself. She could have done better. And so, you know, he vowed that he was never going to leave a cent to them. And uh, really, he was kind of bitter at the community. Anytime that, you know, somebody in the community would approach him to give make a donation to the hospital or make a donation to a swimming pool for the children, his response would always be, well, what has the city ever done for me? Just kind of an angry, bitter man. When his wife died, John uh, had this elaborate monument built in her honor. It was a monument, I mean, this thing was huge, a monster of a love seat with him and his wife sitting at, sitting at opposite ends of the monument. And man, he liked that so much and thought that was so cool that he built another one, and this one was a monument of his wife. You know, these weren't little monuments. These were monsters. Of his wife kneeling at his future gravesite, placing a wreath on the grave. And then later he thought, man, it'd be kind of cool if she had wings. So he, he had this monument builder put some wings on her. And it was just like one idea after the other, and he hired this monument builder to build all these monuments in this, uh, in this graveyard. And finally, at age 92, he died a lonely, poor man. The only person that attended his funeral, guess who? The monument builder. <laughs> That's the only one that attended his funeral. How many know that self-centered living Never makes us happy. The ironic thing about that, all those monuments have been vandalized and they're slowly sinking into that Kansas soil and being literally torn apart. Everything that he poured his, his money in, his hard-earned money into is just disintegrating. That self-centered living never brings happiness. Jesus said this to his disciples. And I tell you what, probably most of you don't have this, this scripture on your refrigerator, but maybe we should. Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. You know, when Jesus was talking about taking up his cross, taking up their cross, he wasn't talking about going out to the jewelry store and getting a nice little silver cross and hanging around their, your neck and letting everybody know you're a Christian. His disciples knew exactly what he was talking about. When he was talking about taking up your cross, they lived in an era where the cross was an instrument of execution. That's all it was. They knew when he said, take up your cross, he was speaking about an instrument of execution, of death. So in other words, Jesus was saying to deny yourself and take up your cross is to, for you and I to die to our fleshly, self-centered, selfish way of, of, of living, the kind of this pleasure-oriented living, and to instead pursue the assignment of God, even though we know it's going to bring hardship at times into our life. Can you say amen? You can't say amen, say oh me. <laughs> Here's the third point that I feel like God dropped in my heart. God's assignment always involves people. It always involves ministering to people. You may be a task-oriented introvert, but your task, your assignment, your mission from God still involves people. You may be shy, like I extremely was and still am today, but your assignment involves people. It involves ministering to people. There was a man in our church. He was here for a few years. I don't even know where he is today. But every time I talked to him, he would say, you know what, I just want to move to the wilderness of Idaho and get away from people. Every time I heard it, every time I talked to him, I just want to move to the wilderness of Idaho and get away from people. I don't know if he realized it, but if he, he may have done that, I don't know. But if he did that, then he absolutely missed the assignment that God has for his life. You can't get away from people and fulfill the assignment that God has for your life. Paul said this, again, back to that scripture, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it to finish the work God assigned to me, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And I know some of you are thinking, I'm just not really equipped to minister to people. You know, I like to work with my hands. I like to do stuff like that. But I'm not really equipped to minister to people. I'm not really a people person. I want to tell you, God, I want to affirm to you that God has deposited in your life giftings and abilities that will distinctly and Holy Spirit empowered allow you and help you to minister to people. It's there. God has equipped you to fulfill your assignment. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 4.10. He says, God's gifts of grace come in many forms. Each of you have received a gift in order to serve others. You should use it faithfully. Would you just say this after me? I have received a gift in order to serve others, and I should use it faithfully. Now turn to your neighbor and say, you have received a gift in order to serve others, and you should use it faithfully. You, you're a dispenser of God's grace. Did you know that? You're a dispenser of God's grace. You've got spiritual gifts that God wants to use you with. He, you know, it's like God has deposited this grace, and they come out in the forms of gifts and abilities and talents. And when we use those, we are ministering to others. And you know, this worship team up here, they are using the gifts that God has placed in them. Now, just because you don't have that gift doesn't mean you don't have a gift. You have a gift. I just met with a gal this week, doesn't go to our church, but she was kind of talking to us about her children's ministry, giving us some ideas. I want to tell you, that lady exudes children. Everything about her is kids. She so desperately wants to minister to kids. She wants to reach lost kids. She wants to disciple saved kids. You know, she wants to prepare them for everything that the world's going to be throwing at them. Now, I love kids, but I don't have that kind of 
that gifting and that, that passion that she does, and she is right in the place that God has for her. Now, your gifting and talent might be something else. We're actually going to talk about that next week. I'm going to give you four or five tips on how you can discover your assignment. How many know your, your assignment is not something that you determine or decide? It is something that you discover. God's already placed it in you. We're going to look at that next week. Everything you need to fulfill your God-given assignment is already in you. You know, I heard that the story uh, during the days of the California gold rush, there was a, a couple that came, became obsessed with going to California and striking it rich in gold. And so they did, man. They sold everything. Sold it. They had this nice little farm in the Midwest, and, and they sold it and, and traveled out there. And it was just one failure after the other until they're absolutely bankrupt. And then finally, you know, they decided they were going to move to Europe. Well, they lived there for a, a few years, and they came back, and they decided to go back to the old home place, that farm that they sold in order to go to California to find gold. And, and when they got there, they discovered that it was surrounded by security guards and a high-wire fence. And when they asked about it, they discovered that their old farm had become the second largest gold reserve in America and it was now owned by the government. You know, they had been sitting on this property, this amazing ability, these amazing resources all the time, and they didn't even know it. How many know God has placed spiritual gifts and abilities in your life, and you may not even see them? You may not even recognize them. By the way, we have something called growth track, and it's a couple sessions after service, about 15 minutes after the service up in the upper building. We'll feed you, take care of your kids. And the first one Bobby and I gave last week on just the kind of the core values of the church, this one that happens today is really a spiritual gifts assessment that will help you discover what your spiritual gifts are, what your personality type is, and, and maybe where you might be able to plug in and serve in your God-given assignments. So... I want to encourage you, even if you didn't sign up, you can make your way up there. They'll feed you, and you can go through that. You know, it's so important, I believe, that we discover what God has placed in us and not live our lives like a rat kind of wandering through the maze trying to figure out what we're supposed to do. What corner do I take now? What turn do I go now, you know, God's not trying to hide it from us. The scripture says that the purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, and a man or woman of wisdom draws it out. What does that mean? God's already placed it there. That assignment is already there, and it's up to us to draw it out. You know why I believe 87% of Christians never find out what their assignment is? Because they really never take the time to talk to God about it, and pray about it, and seek the Lord and set aside some time and say, God, show me what you've called me to do. Show me why I'm here on this planet. I'm not here just to eat groceries and live for the weekend. I'm here to do something for you. God has an assignment for your life. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be inconvenient at times. I just want to warn you about that. But when you focus on fulfilling it, You'll make a difference in the lives of other people. And you will live the most fulfilled life that you possibly can on this planet. Let's stand this morning. Looking at a lot of people today with an assignment from God. I see you. I see you. You can't hide. Maybe you can hide from me, but you can't hide from God. And there's no reason to. As I've discovered, you know, I, like I said, I had a lot of excuses for not stepping into some of the things that God has called me to do. And that, that was a process. You know, it started with serving on the worship team. And then it led to leading the worship team. And then it moved to leading small groups. Well, first of all, it, it led to being involved in a small group, which I thought was terrifying and didn't want to do. 
And then I got involved in a small group, then it led to leading a small group, then it led to full-time ministry, leading youth. We led our youth ministry for about seven years. That was something I was terrified to do. Teenagers scared me, scared my wife. I don't know about Brett. He was involved in it. They scare you? I don't know. Sometimes. Teenagers can be scary sometimes. Then it led to stepping into this role. And I don't know what else God has. But every step of the way was uncomfortable, stretching, painful at times. Times I got burnt out. Times that I just thought, Lord, I'm throwing in the towel. I can't do it anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. But yet, when we keep resolutely focused and pressing ahead, there is such a joy. There's a fulfillment. And, and, And sometimes I'm so grateful when God allows me to see some of the fruit of my labors. When somebody gets set free. When somebody gets ministered to through somehow something the Holy Spirit's doing through my life or through the giftings that he's placed in my life, I'm so excited. There's been times that I have ministered in, the, in a counseling office and I, I've been praying for people and, you know, the Holy Spirit has quickened me about some roots or some bondages that need to be broken and we see that person set free. And there's been times that I, 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 I've driven home and it felt like the car was driving about six inches off of the, of the pavement. You know, I, I just burst into a song of joy. I didn't even know. I didn't even try to do that. It just came out of my spirit because there's such a joy in fulfilling the assignment that God has given us. What are you doing for the Lord? I believe there's two questions that God is going to ask us when we get to heaven. Number one is, what did you do with my son, Jesus? And number two, what did you do with the gifts and the talents and abilities and the time and opportunities I gave you on planet Earth? There's going to be an accounting. I don't think any of us are doing everything that we can for the Lord. I know I'm not. And I keep asking the Lord. Now, this, I'm not, this is not a drive-by guilt in here. You know, I'm not trying to throw some guilt on you. I'm trying to challenge you, though, because people's lives depend on it. God has equipped you to touch certain people that I can't touch, to minister in ways that I don't minister. And, and those people are waiting for you to step up into your assignment and say, like Isaiah said, God, here am I. Send me. I I, I don't know about my abilities. I feel a little bit disqualified. I'm not sure how you can use me, but Lord, here I am. I'm willing to do it. I wonder if there's anybody here today that would raise your hand and say, God, I'm willing to do the assignment that you've called me to do. Hallelujah. Fourteen of us. Great. No, there's a few more. Hallelujah. And if you didn't raise your hand, you need to wonder about that. You need to ask yourself, why didn't I raise my hand? I'm serious. This is a, I'm serious. This is a serious word. I just got, I just felt very serious all of a sudden by the Holy Spirit because he's challenging you. Jesus said, do the work while you still can before the time ends and it gets, the darkness comes and we no longer can. This is our season. This is our time. I know you got a full-time job, but you still got time to serve the Lord. There's still something God has called you to do. I want to challenge you to begin to seek the Lord about what that is and begin to do it. Let's pray. I don't want to step on your toes too bad. Hallelujah. Father, I'm I'm, I'm seeing some amazing people here, full of the Holy Spirit, gifted, qualified by you, called, given an assignment. Some may know what that is, some, some may not. I pray for those that don't know yet that you would enlighten the eyes of their hearts, that you would reveal to them beyond a shadow of a doubt what you've called them to do, open up the doors, help them to begin to take those baby steps. And it may be a small beginning, but Lord, give them the, the faithfulness to continue to minister even in that area 
where it seems like there's not a lot of, flu, of fruit, Lord, you said don't despise the day of small beginnings. And whatever that beginning looks like, God, give them a faithfulness and a resolute heart and a devotion to do that thing in Jesus' name. And Lord, as we do, I pray that you would anoint them, equip them. God, pour out of your spirit upon them. Use them in a powerful way to do the things that you've called them to do and live the life of fulfillment and joy that you've called them to live. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.